My name is Richard van der Leeken. I'm the founder and creative director of What Design Can Do. And today we host urgent conversations on social justice and design. Uh, before we start, I first would like to thank Mark Sfers and the design team for this fantastic collaboration. It's important to join forces when it matters. And today is one of those days. Um, as What Design Can Do, we have always been focusing on societal issues and how design and creativity can be uh, a positive uh, force in that. In these historical times where all kinds of crises meet each other, we see a great momentum to discuss issues and also for us as an organization to do some thorough introspection. We are very lucky to do that with amazing people from our international network. We started the day with a one-on-one -on -one conversation about media power with Arab American journalist Ahmed Shihab El Din. The second conversation was about decolonizing design with the British graphic designer and writer Anusha, Anushka Kandwala and Kenyan creative director Sunny Dole. What we learned from these first two sessions is the importance of context. We all have to acknowledge and be aware of the context we live in whether we report in national and international media, and when we create, or in other words, when we design. Being aware of the heritage and the history of a variety of visual, lang of visual languages makes us understand better where we come from and where we can go together. We will wrap up today with a session called Creating for Gender Equality. This session will be moderated by Dutch, Dutch curator Saskia van Steyn, she will be speaking with Mexican curator Jimena Acosta and Brazilian designer and activist Larissa Ribeiro. This session will specifically focus on the situation in Latin America. Saskia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Richard. Um, I think, if I'm correct, it so yes, it was already mentioned. I'm a curator, headmaster of Critical Inquiry Lab at the Design Academy. Very warm welcome. Um, I'm the moderator of today, and some of you may know me actually as the anchor woman of what design can do. And a very special welcome to everybody around the globe, but in particular an hola to my friends in Mexico. Um, as mentioned already, in the following hour, I'll have a conversation um, with two guests. And uh, when I say conversation, I take a modest position, in fact, in listening to uh, Jimena and uh, to Larissa. But maybe uh, uh, just a few words on, on the session itself. Uh, this session is uh, namely organized in collaboration with uh, Centro de Futuros, a space for multidisciplinary experimentation and visions of a future. Uh, and it's an ongoing discussion in a broader spectrum called it's a, brave new, it's a Brave New World. So yes, the final talk of today, the third talk, is about creating for gender equality. We will map um, the role of design, gender, race, violence. We'll be paying special attention to notions of intersectionality within the Latin American context. We aim to emphasize and share thoughts on how the creative sector as a whole can um, contribute to a safer and more equitable, equitable society. Roughly uh, an hour conversation. Um, we'll start with shaping the contexts. We'll talk about the practice of our two guests and then we'll zoom out a little bit and speculate on which role design has to play within society at large. Now, if you're out there and you have any questions for our guests, please put them in the chats, either on uh, Facebook or uh, on other social media out there, YouTube platform. And I'll try to touch base it, but it does help me if you would address the question to a particular person. Right. Um, without further ado, maybe uh, Larissa, can I uh, invite you to jump in and to tell a little bit about who you are and where you come from. Hi, Saskia. Hi, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank you all so much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. And I'll start introducing a little bit of myself and what I do. My name is Larissa Ribeiro. I'm a graphic artist from Sao Paulo, Brazil, where I am now. 
and I'm co-founder of a feminist online magazine called Asmina and also of a platform called Mulheres Ilustradoras, that means women illustrators, which is an open directory of female illustrators in Brazil. I also run a design studio and I'm, I'm a co-author of a children's book called President of the Jungle. That's a story about democracy, the democratic electoral process. And it's been published in 18 different countries. I'm very proud of this work. And in my work as an artist, I've been developing a research on gender representation and equality in the field of visual communication. Yeah. And that's only sort of a very brief outline of all the yeah, marvelous yeah, things very, you've been up brief. to as, a, as <laughs> yeah. a graphic designer and an activist. Um, and uh, now reaching out to Mexico, Jimena, would you introduce yourself to our, uh, to our audience? Sure. Saskia, thank you much, so much for having me. Also, thank you for what design can do and uh, to all the partners to make this, making this possible. And thank pleasure. you to Larissa for this conversation. I'm really excited about it. Um, well, I'm a curator. Actually, I was trained as, an, as a contemporary art curator. And little by little, I kind of drifted towards design. And mostly all the shows that I've worked on that I like the most have to do with design and the art of protest, design and climate change or climate emergency, as you might call it, and design and, um, and female, like female empowerment. Like my last exhibition was called, I Will What I Want, Design and Empowerment, Women's Design and Empowerment. So it all has, has, has to do with reflecting on current issues. Either it's like social justice or equity, gender equity. Like the conversation has been always like around, like trying to process all this and get, understand that through the work of others. Also this year, I'm super happy to be the guest curator of the Abierto Mexicano de Diseño. So actually our topic for the whole festival and for the main exhibition is design and utopia, immediate actions for a better present. And um, I thought about this subject before the pandemia and in the middle of all, the pandemia started, right? So it's been like really interesting, like the shift or thinking, because like thinking about design and utopia, we were thinking, okay, how can we design for the future, for like a better future is such a crisis, no? Like in such an emer a state of emergency in every sector, like in every way possible in Mexico and abroad. And suddenly like the pandemic started like advancing from China to elsewhere or like whatever it started like to elsewhere. And now we're like in Mexico city, all like in the lockdown, still planning the festival and is still thinking about the exhibition. And that kind of like break has been super interesting to actually be in that emergency, no? like a health emergency and trying to figure out like new ways of thinking and curating and um, and bringing all these topics forward and um, within that context the exhibition was thought or like the whole uh, festival was thought about talking about gen the regeneration of the of the environment and also about how to make um, the context like social context city more feminist like like the feminist issue is, is it is there because it is urgent so we kind of like working in that intersection yeah yeah and when is the when is the exhibition due just to get a little point on the horizon yes so pre-pandemia we're like scheduled for october and we're trying to get to that to that date like the first week of october yeah this yeah. year so let's see so we'll, we're going to touch upon, uh, let's say, the, the magnifying, if I may call it that, uh, effect that, uh, that the pandem pandemic has in fact caused, as far as I'm concerned. But maybe, maybe just to sort of sketch first a little bit, and I'd like to start, you, start with you, uh, as you already nearly started, sketching the context that, that is your day-to-day -day reality. Could you take us by the hand and give us some perspectives on... Uh, the current state of affairs within uh, gender inequality in, in your own, let's say, local specific context? Yes. So, um, so well, as you're I mean, we're like Mexico and Latin America, are like there's like a really big struggle on um, derechos humanos, like what's the name? Human rights, no? Human rights and 
human rights, thinking about like female rights, like reproductive, reproductive rights. And on top of that, because they're like really Catholic countries, we have like a huge rate of feminicide in Mexico. So before the pandemic started, like there were like this, like every year in the 8th of March, we have huge marches, like people protesting in the street, mostly women. It's International uh, Women's Day. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and the marches, like they always focus on feminicide. It's not just reproductive rights. It's not just like taking the street and talking about Planned Parenthood as they do it in the, in the United States. It's like more urgent. It's about please don't kill us, or like we demand that you stop killing us. Like we demand that you take action on the huge rates of female murders that they are. No, and it's really hard to use the word murder because that's what it is. Like many times in the news, they say, "Well, th there was um, there was a death. Okay, like who killed her?" No? So. Thinking about this, like we were thinking, okay, how do we, how do we tackle that? And before the, the coronavirus hit Mexico, like maybe two weeks before, there was like the most, um, like the bigger march ever seen. There were like around 80,000 people on the streets, no? And uh, may I show you images? Like I was thinking, look, how design addresses these topics, no? How yeah. design has tackled this. And shall we think, shall we just before we dive into the context sorry. as specifically we <laughs> just also let's say jump over to Larissa for one sure, second sure, sure. so she can sketch the context so we stay a little bit in line yes thank you sorry uh, no prob no prob <laughs> Larissa could you sketch your your day-to-day -day reality when it comes to this topic yeah I think we have uh, much in common in uh, Brazil and Mexico uh, we have like very alarming numbers here because uh, According to the UN, Brazil is the fifth country in femicides in the world. So as Jimena said, we are protesting and not just for reproductive rights, we're protesting for them to stop killing women. And recently we've had this huge research here in Brazil that uh, found out that uh, more than 60% of the interviewed people thought that uh, the women were responsible for the violence that were perpetrated against them. So, for instance, when we're still the media just um, still the media puts that uh, like a woman has been killed, but she had she was doing something that was making her men jealous, or, or she wore clothes that were too revealing. And so we have this culture here that still um, puts the responsibility on the victims. So it's and the blaming is, and shaming. Yes, yes. and. Um, it's also very common for general culture to think of the problem as an issue of security and punishment of the aggressors. So we don't have uh, many programs that uh, prioritize education and prevention of um, the violence, especially because we have this thinking of um, uh, women should stop wearing those clothes or should stop like should conform to a very retrograde uh, gender role and we are still in this process of changing culture to stop blaming women for their own killing yeah so yeah and so, if we're going to talk about sorry if we're going to talk about reproductive uh, health and sexual health of women we ha we've had a huge regression in the past few years with the government that we have now and i would call it even a disaster that's been worsening so much the the epidemics that we have here in gender violence uh, for instance yeah. and and this month it was released by the ministry of health a uh, technical note on women's reproductive health talking about contra contraception and then after it got to the presidency the, the this note was taken away because they were saying that it was defending uh, apo uh, apology of the crime of abortion and then they fired every one of the technicians that were responsible for the technical notes. So I, I would say the situation here is very alarming. Yeah, yeah. And how would you actually root that historically? You already mentioned the, the politics, but if we dig, let's say, a little bit deeper, how, how would you situate this, um, this given in all its complexities? Well, I, um, I think... 
it's, it's very hard to understand um, what are the, the real uh, roots of this um, gender bias here in Brazil, but I would say that I, I think there's a number that we should not overlook that is um, this violence that's happening here has a very particular cut of uh, race. So we're, when we're talking about numbers in the last 10 years, uh, homicides of black women have increased more than 60%, while uh, homicides of uh, white women have increased, but only less than 2%. Yeah. So we, were, we are talking about not only a gender issue, but also a class and race issue. And I think we have in Brazil this particular um, situation that we don't, we, in society likes to, uh, to say that there is no racism in Brazil because every, everyone is like mixed race and everyone is like, oh, we're all friends. There is no racism, but uh, well, it's just a matter of testing that poorest people are black, you know? So people like to conceal the thinking of um, uh, the, that there is racism. And this, uh, this makes it very difficult for us to confront the problem because if you won't even admit that the problem exists, you can't uh, address directly the solution. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's no way we can talk about the his historical um, uh, origin of this problem if, if we don't talk about race. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's actually also another parallel with COVID that, that globally people of color, uh, uh, black uh, and, and poor people have been hit uh, disproportionately uh, hard uh, by the pandemic. Um, maybe. Um, uh, uh, Shamina, could you sketch your uh, historical rooting uh, of of the um, of the femicide? Yes. What are what do you what do you have for clues for us? So I think it's now open, right? Yes. So I think like the talk or like um, some like real analysts and for uh, things that study this has said that it is rooted like the increase in feminicide. It is of course rooted in in the uh, in the criminal system, right? So it's like a it's like a side business for like the organized crime. So you have drugs and you have all this happening. Plus, oh, you can traffic also people, and that of course leads to trafficking women, trafficking girls. So that's been huge for the last decade or more, I think. And um, so if that's a business, it just just goes uh, for the sex industry. If you say trafficking, exactly. Okay. Yes, for Just, the sex industry, exactly. Yeah. So one, I think one is that. Also, we do live in a in a really misogynistic society. Like many people, like many women, get killed by by her husband, by their couples, by the neighbor or just by the guy that was passing down the street that couldn't help thinking that he could rape that girl and he could kill her. By the way afterwards no it, like i think society has really uh like there's like a big issue of education and i assume it, it it's intertwined with the reproductive rights because if you persistently talk about this woman has no rights over her body no she would be guilty if he, she gets killed she will be guilty if she gets pregnant no? um, then you kind of see her as an object, I think, yeah. more and more, with no agency. Um, and the, and so, don't you, isn't there something to be said maybe for like a, a religious interpretation or a root? Yes, of course, like Mexico is super Catholic and, uh, and all, they always think you've, you're killing the baby, no? you're killing a baby as opposed to, um, and you are like these women with no, I th okay, so going back a bit, I think it is the fantasy of um, of our of like a niche of people that kind of brainwash everyone to to make you not think that that it's a privilege to not that education is a privilege that sexual education is a privilege, and that actually taking care of your body is a privilege. So instead of putting it in those terms, they say no, we're all equals, and if something happens to you because you did something wrong. And that is based in Catholicism, no? Because your body is not yours. It's either 
the, the government or your husbands or the state or the religion, you know? And, and is this also similarly rooted in this idea of, of mixed race, like Larissa was pointing out? Yeah, that's interesting. Yes. Like, I think like the, like the discourse, like it's ambiguous, no, like we all are the same, but no, we're not. Like Mexico is super class based, it's super race based. And actually the, the women that like are more vulnerable, like more fragile are the workers, like the workers that have to go 5 a.m., cross seven streets, walk in, take five buses and get to work, no? Yeah. So you are like at risk, you're at risk of getting, um, of getting um, kidnapped, of having some kind of like problem with someone on the way or, and, and now getting COVID. So that is class-based, no? Like very few people have the privilege of um, having like a nice job where you get like a nice hours and then you have your own car, so you drive around. So even if you're a woman, you have more things that surround you that protect you, like an infrastructure. Right? Yeah, and are, are these like still colonial based, would you say? Are these like very long threads from a, a deep history? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it's like... Well, I can nearly yeah. feel the urgency. So uh, Larissa, you, were want yeah. to, you wanted to add something, jump in. Yeah, I wanted to ask Jimena how is the situation in the Congress in Mexico, because here, for instance, even though women are more than 50% of the population, we, we only have a number of 15% of women representatives in our Congress, which means that the laws that are regulating our bodies are being made by men. And of also, it, it's very interesting that you were talking about religion, because here in Brazil, we also have this very strong with a religious culture, but I think it's very um, contradictory because we're talking about religion when we're talking about abortion and women's reproductive rights because we cannot kill any babies as they name it. But then the state has no policies for um, uh, assuring a, a nice childhood for these babies that are born. They have no policies for the health of this woman that maybe uh, we're go we're, is going to die in the process of an insecure abortion and everything. So I think it's very complicated and it has to do with politics at, every time because we're talking about these laws that are made by people who are interested in controlling women's bodies. Yeah, yes. yeah. So it's, it, 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 you wanted, it was a question, so jump yeah, in. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was curious to know about this. How yeah. is, is the balance balanced in no, Mexico? I agree with you. Like I, I don't know exactly the, the, the like the figures, but they like definitely like who are making like the lawmakers don't really are not embedded in the culture of care, no? Like you give birth to someone that has to have has to be breastfed, that has to be nurtured, that has to be loved and taken care of. And that's so many like so much work. You have to put so much effort on bringing up someone that certainly like, the guys that are like ruling don't know, no, like the, the, the economy of care, no, how, how much do you have to care to, to this life that has a good life? So yeah. uh, the childcare has been defunded, for example, which is with like, if you don't have childcare, you can't work. That's it, no? Yeah. Yeah, so all these systems are intertwined, but we already talked about so many different aspects of, let's say, representation or the lack of representation in politics, in role models, um, and even, let's say, the structures of care. Um, it, I think it does sketch, in fact, how urgent it is and how much is, um, how weighty uh, the conversation is. Um, and, and that, of course, is then the question, how do you address this with design? Um, Larissa, maybe I may ask you to sort of take us a little bit by the hand, how you address this with your practice. Um, and, and on a very personal note, how did you get started? I mean, the jump from architecture to activism, if I may call it that, through the lens of photography, graphic identity, art direction, you, and, and, and the writing of books, and obviously also being involved with education. Can you show us some examples of the things that you've been up to? Yeah, I think I got started from um, when I, I studied architecture, but I've always um, worked with visual communication. And as soon as I left college, I worked for a very big publishing house here in Brazil. 
and I worked in a magazine that were the the produced content for men and had this very objectifying view of the the woman once one time I had a discussion with my boss because he wanted to publish um, an, an article saying that if the women are showing their bra strap is because they want they want sex. It was like in this level of, of objectification. And I started to realize the power that um, uh, com media and communication have in creating this uh, image that we have of ourselves. And I reflected so much about it. And I, I started uh, noticing the images in advertising as well, as, uh, how they objectify women and how we perceive ourselves as objects that don't deserve to be uh, listened to and respected. And maybe I'm, go I'm gonna have to spend more time trying to be beautiful, trying to be like some ornament and not fighting for something that I think is right. So I think mo uh, first of all, visual communication is a matter of working in the um, imaginary realm of people. So you're talking about constructing, con constructing a sense of self-identity that um, uh, you can't, you, you get bombarded every day with these messages, with this, like these bodies that are the, the authorized bodies that you have to be like perfect and thin and white to be deserving of men's attention. We're not talking about deserving of power. We're not talking about being something like um, that's going to make a difference. You, you want to be something that men are going to admire yeah. or a mother that's going to take care of, of children. So you have this gender stereotypes and I'm not talking about, uh, and I'm criticizing the fact that women want to be admired or be caregivers. I'm talking about the compulsory status of this, um, that, that when, when you talk about this, these roles and like they're the only option you have. Yeah. You know? So when, we, when I was invited to create this, um, this magazine, Asmina, we, we, had, we were in a period in Brazil where this, uh, this uh, content for women that were created in magazines, for instance, it was really misogynistic. We were only talking about how to please a man. They ignored like, not all women were heterosexual. You, you couldn't talk about those things in the media. You were talking always about how to get thinner because it's obvious that all women must get thinner to be like uh, validated for society. And we got, I got together with this uh, very talented journalists and they wanted to make this shift. We are all studying feminist texts. We were all tired of not recognizing ourselves in the media. So we started building that. And I had the mission to think about um, a visual identity that, could, that, that, that would not bring forth those standards that we were so um, uncomfortable with. Yeah. And At do the you have something time, to I, show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going, yeah. I'm going to show this now. <laughs> uh, this is, I'm going to sh uh, share my screen with you. Um, just let me know if you can see it. I see a, a sort of double screen. Yes, there we are, full yes. screen, yes. So here's an illustration that I created in the first year of Azmina. And we had this uh, challenge that we had no money whatsoever because we were ju just doing this as a passion project. And we had to create with, with what was available. And what was available for us was stock image or free images that, that were on the internet. And all those images were, of course, of white women. And we started to think about uh, intersectionality and diversity and how we could uh, summarize this in a visual communication. So I started doing these collages where in the beginning here, you can see that they're not, that they're trying like, they're more concealed. I don't know, I tried to make this very, so you're working with the bodies in a very proportional way. And we're working with what we had available for us in the, in the internet, so in terms of um, free images that we could use. And I was thinking, uh, at first I was thinking about getting those bodies and making some kind of Frankenstein, like, as, so I could have some diversity represented here and I could not, use much of um, 
synthesis thinking, because if we're talking about diversity, we're going to talk about many images of many uh, women together. And this is just like the beginning, the seed of what my work has become afterwards, working with Asmina, because I still think this is too rooted in the reality. So it's too palpable and maybe you cannot, uh, you cannot still see yourself representing something like that. So the evolution to that with the limitations that we had was something around like in this in this visuality. This is where we start to mix um, images of women in a more active position. Uh, if you study the history of art, you're going to see that the portrayal of women over time has always been in a very passive position, in a very um, uh, ornamental way, or looking to the spectator as if inviting him to to possess her body or something like that. So this is exactly what we didn't want. So we started to work with this um, women in this position of speaking for themselves, of having a voice. And I started also to work with this, um, um, with this narrative where we could like uh, be mixed with animals in a, in, a, in a way to represent a bit of the feeling that we're having inside so and the use of color as well so that we cannot uh, immediately look at an image and um, and see if people are black and white we were trying to make something as uh, in a way that women could recognize themselves uh, independently from uh, the stock that we have yeah I don't know if and I'm is this making no, no, you make it perfectly clear. It's all very passionate. And uh, the only thing that's not clear to me is this an online magazine or is it this uh, distributed, uh, disseminated magazine in, uh, in real life, let's say? No, it's just online. And it has grown so much since its beginning in 2015. Because we, in the beginning, we thought of making a, a printed magazine, but the costs for that were so surreal that we didn't. We, we abandoned that that idea in the very beginning. Yeah. So it's just it's just an online magazine today, but we are very proud to be like um, uh, so sometimes we raise issues that afterwards uh, appear in the big media here in Brazil even though it's still a very small uh, magazine, a very small uh, media, um, a, a very small publication, it has an impact on bigger ve vehicles. So we, and we all, we have all of our content is uh, licensed in Creative Commons, so anyone can republish it. So it's a very um, nice to have this open culture as well. And we articulate with other organizations so that they can uh, replicate our content. Yeah, and it's still uh, only online. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna show you some other images. This is wow, an evolution of our way to when we're we're talking about gender and sexuality. This is something in my research that found a way to be able to be in the social media because the first attempts that we did to normalize um, the parts of the body in social media got us blocked many, many times on Instagram and Facebook because we couldn't show women's female nipples. So yeah. this is also a way that we found to have some humor and at the same time create this image of diverse, diversity in, in not only gender, but also in uh, sexual orientation. Yeah, and just to show you a bit of how this thinking of the semantics uh, evolves in my work, uh, I've tried to I started to mix not only the images like the photographic images with also some uh, more abs abstract forms, so that I thought that women could also look at the images and feel uh, feel themselves represented through a feeling as well, in a way that we can connect. Um, the, yeah. the, the things that we have inside with this form. So we're, we're, we, it's very important that we acknowledge the, the form and the physicality of our bodies and that the, the divergent bodies can um, have, feel themselves as powerful bodies in, in all the spaces that they occupy, but also to be able to connect it with our subjectivity. Yeah. 
yeah and a, lo a lot of color and pattern and of course yeah, frag or the collage think... to me is like the, the the fragmentation is also very important i would say yeah and i i go i wander through this path of creating some new forms and i have a, here a little a small video of my process oh and here it is i don't i i think it's i'm gonna show you here because okay because i have this process where i try to not uh, work with uh, the pencil and draw because I think that my hand is always going to be uh, directed by these standards that have been rooted in me by media and by all the images that I've seen. So what I try to do in my process is to work with more abstract forms and with them create these types of different bodies so that we in a more abstract way we could maybe look at it and recognize ourselves in um, yeah, so it's a, so it's a hybrid between analog making and then digital yeah. interpretations and sort of also bypassing maybe the, yes, the restraints. Yes, I always start with I always start with uh, some random production of images, not not only collages but also with uh, paint splashes, for instance, and things like that. And yeah. this is like the it's result really of it. And given the time, I have to. We have to. Uh, yeah. May, there was one other project you wanted to share, if I'm correct. No, it's a, yeah, I'm, I just wanted to talk about a little bit about our uh, another um, sphere that I work with. In Nazmina, for instance, we we have just launched this project this uh, this week, this last Monday, that associates the, the design thinking with this um, with technology to. Um, be able to reach or to simplify some complex messages. For instance, this is a website that practically uh, that uses uh, artificial intelligence to scrape all the bills and projects that, that are up in the in Brazilian Congress. And then we have 15 NGOs uh, analyzing this data, and then we create a, a rank with all the, the politics, the, the, the politicians. So people can wow. come here and see how they how the people they voted to is performing uh, when talking about uh, women's uh, women's issues, you know. So you have this, and then you can read everything about um, how your your deputy, how your congressman has voted in women's uh, interests. So you're so, basically creating the data uh, in order to create the proof, or let's say to give an to give an insight in in how um, let's say the political system is dealing with representation with, and with and, representation yeah. and health issues and violence and everything. So basically, I I, I like to define it as a bridge because. When the information is there and it's available, but it's so, it's so much information is so disorganized that people cannot have access to it. And the way I see it is that design is, makes this bridge uh, between the technology and the information that is available and the final user. And so it makes it understandable. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever thought about going into politics yourself? I mean, to me, your work is very political, obviously, but just to put the question out there. I think I am in politics right okay, now. Okay, fair and enough. I think, I think communication is a very important part of politics. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't <laughs> agree more. Thank you for this brief introduction. We'll talk, touch upon some of your other work uh, in a minute. Um, but uh, Gemina, are you still with us? I can't. Yes, I can, yes. I'm here. Can you listen to? Can you listen to me? Yes, there you yeah. are. Fantastic. Okay. Cool. Um, also for you, obviously, the question like how do you, how does this then filter into the work you do, and what do you pick up on uh, with your yeah. practice? Well, I think uh, like Larissa's work is amazing. Congratulations, Larissa! It's like so beautiful, and I think it has to do with decolonizing our mind. I'm not. Do you hear yes. me? No, I can. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. Perfect. Thank you. Decolonizing our mind and decolonizing the way we construct our own image, we construct the image of others. And also this thing about data, it connects perfectly with one thing I wanted to show you. Jump in. Yes, let me share my screen. Wait, wait, wait. So, okay, wait a sec. 
I'm going to share my screen right now. So, do you have it? Is it there? Uh, it's not on full screen yet. Great. That is so, now the fact, yes. So talking about how like to link Larissa's work with this, like this is not my work, this is like a really, really famous database that Maria Salguero, a non-designer, like a citizen journalist, made from all the feminist sites in Mexico. So about this missing ways of like how to, like how the designers make visible this. Uh, I've been thinking about this. Now Maria Salguero did this database, everyone can access it. And then, and, it's it. Sorry, just one question. The color coding that we see is that, that ah, that's related to years, not to quantity. Related to years and then related to the type of murder. So who killed her, in which terms, like with a knife or with a gun or with like asphyxiation, like it depends. Huh? Yeah, incredible. It's really hardcore. Like, yeah, she's, and she's amazing. And she just was named from like Forbes, uh, named her like the most, um, uh, like the 10 most important women in blah, blah. So she made this da missing data set, no? And then how you make it visible. So in the marches of the, March 8, two collectives, like designer collectives made this visible, like marching, like in a performative way and also like in a material way. So these are like the Las Cintas de la Memoria in Spanish. So in English would be like the, like the ribbons of the memory, like the mm -hmm. memory ribbons. So like a group of designers got together and like translated all the codes and all the names that are named in my, in, in Maria Salguero's document, like they handwritten it in ribbons. And then these ribbons was like a, like this, this kind of mobile construction that like walked all through the marches. So like the march was like all these anonymous women coming together and then this group of designers like marching with this. And it was like super interesting, like all the interaction of making people, yeah, we're marching because these women are missing, like we're marching for these women that are not here. So the role of design, I think, has been making visible these issues, no? First, like a citizen, um, Maria Salguero, which is like a citizen and it's like a, it's not a government agency, just someone really concerned and uh, she makes this map, but then how you design it, no? How you make it, like you, how you, you take it to the street, so this happened and then something like really beautiful happened. Like some like people approached in the march and said, hey, my sister is not there. My, my mother is not there. So they, in a wall, like in front of Bellas Artes, they started like writing up the names and then they sent it to Maria Salguero so she could like complete the database. Yeah. So this is one example. And the second example is this one, which was like another collective, like women's collective, uh, also designers, artists, called SCJ uh, with stencils, like, like just using typography and paint, put this in the, in the Zocalo, like in the middle of the main square in Mexico City. So this, which the hashtag ni una menos and ni una más, like it's really simple. It's just like a brand, right? Ni una más, ni una menos, it's like a brand. So I think design has helped making it visible, no? It hasn't helped it stop, but in a way, it, like, it's the first step. Yeah. No? And it is so important. Now, it, it is such a powerful gesture that one day after, they erased it. Who's they? No? The government, like yeah. the cleaners. So if it's like, this is like an anti-monument, like could have, it could have stay, stayed, like, no? But you, why don't you protect this memory? like this image, which is kind of like the Maya Lin's image in Washington, or like all memorials have, have this, just like naming no? yes. the people that are not here. And like so this even really the memorial gets, gets, first you start with a, a mobile memorial and this memorial also gets swiped out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, so going back to your question, how design has played into, I think, as Larissa said, like, it, like it's, it's really important to like, deconstruct and then deconstruct and like, like be, oh, okay, we need the data. So make available that data and then that data make it visible, no? So yeah. I assume they're like, yeah. 
I want some time left to talk about, let's say, how, how we can then from the visual jump to the breaking the, the perpetual um, uh, repetition. So if there's a, some systemic um, change to be made, but maybe first you would want to introduce your projects. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, so really, really fast, like thinking about um, like women and think, I mean, thinking about like equity, no? Look, so um, I did this project like uh, two years ago. It was an exhibition first installed in Parsons and then in Mucaroma. And it had like this three components that were super in, in important, like for me. So like trying to get to the point of like, how can you make equity? How design has played a part of gender equity. Uh, with Shell Miller Fisher, like we co-curated this exhibition that had to do with uh, empowering no, the mind, educating. So like addressing all these editorial projects that have been part of reeducating and uh, naming the female body. And uh, also, ad no, sorry, addressing all the design gestures uh, intertwined with science or with medicine that have helped to control women's body and fertility, like, and have agency over it, no? Like, yeah. I want and, to be- And what are we looking at here? Oh, this is like a Sayana press. It's like a contraceptive actually is made like from, it's like collaboration between Pfizer and PASS. PASS are like this group of designers, amazing, that they always design for the emergency crisis. So this is distributed in Africa, like in very locations in Africa. And it's kind of like this hack, like this Sayana press um, helps you through three months without contraception. Uh, and you can like inject it everywhere, like any place, in any place of the body. And nobody has to know. So, I mean, the point is like having access. So they're supposed to distribute it through some like clinics, like um, free clinics or whatever. So how design has helped to gain agency over fertility, over menstrual flow, no? Yes. So all these kind of like small gestures, like small companies that all over the world say, okay, so if you have to act like a male body and not, and control your menstruation, okay, so there's like a long list of, of, of hacks, of objects designed for this. Of course, the question remains, it's like, why do you have to control it, no? Why do you have to uh, encapsulate or like, but so this was kind of the reflection, like thinking about equity and obviously think, taking it also towards uh, the labor embedded in maternity and in motherhood, in breastfeeding, like all that unpaid labor that right now is saving our lives, no? Like the care economy. Yes, yeah. And that is, uh, that is um, that's the exhibition, I will what I want, women design and empowerment. For those of you uh, who want to look it up on your website, but yes, yeah. you're making a jump to yeah, I'm the Black so sorry. Panthers. No problem. Yeah, sorry. No, I just was, I have, we think no, we have no time. No, I just wanted to make it in the section of like interests. Between... We make time for that. Jump in. Yeah? Okay. Yes, of course. Yeah, so like this was like another exhibition that I did in Chicago, but it has to do with like the art of protest. So like historically going back to the graphics that were like powerful and that actually have like a message and convey a message to empower a community, you know, a disfranchised community. And that was the case with Chemory Douglas and the Black Panthers and the, the newspapers that he designed for the Black Panthers, you no? Know? which are like precise and amazing and like go to the point and have like the issues that we're dealing or like the United States are dealing with or the black community in the United States right now, now like the uh, yeah. black imprisonment. No? Yeah. So it's just like all these different uh, kind of issues at the, become one eventually, no? Yes, they are all interrelated. Exactly. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, wow, thank you both for, uh, for amazing work and a, and a beautiful insight in, um, uh, in your work. Um, Larissa, I was, want I was wondering uh, if you could say something about how these projects could scale up. So for instance, what is the correlation uh, between let's say the individual designer and uh, women's movements or 
is there are you investigating that at all at this moment this idea to scale up or to to create resonance yeah i think um the first thing that we're trying to do is um to get ourselves associated with other organizations and then try to um, make it bigger uh, one thing i think it's essential is the the open source culture uh, the the fact that I, everything we produce is free and that everyone can access and uh, republish is very important because we don't have we don't want just the people who can pay for the information to be able to access it so i think it's really really important and i think um we have a very uh, we think a lot about uh, how to redefine uh, the, the imagination of people, how this information that we're producing can get to the, the inner narratives that everyone has. If we're talking about, especially about visual communication, and I think many of the people who are watching us are designers and are, and are thinking about how individually each one of them can help to, uh, to do something for social change. Um, I think it's very important to design pamphlets and to be with the movements and to be on the streets. But I also think that we have to be aware that um, um, it's very uh, it's very important to um, access the imagination of people. Because if you change culture, if if I'm, I'm like to art direct a magazine cover. And I'm trying to put there uh, different kinds of bodies, like fat women, black women, indigenous women, like um, uh, people with from minoritized uh, 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 communities. I'm trying to. Uh, I'm. I'm in a way acting in this uh, imaginary world where people construct their identities. And I'm not only talk representation as. If black women see ourselves in the cover, they can feel like they can have power and be like a successful businesswoman and everything. I'm also talking about the white girls that are going to see that cover and are going to see a black woman as a potential boss or a poten potential people in power. So I'm not only talking about a sense of self-identity, I'm talking about as well as the way we see people. Yeah. So I think and creating new of... relations and other hierarchies than only through the current um, sure. hierarchies that are at play. Yeah. So I think that's why it's so important that we produce this this content not only in um, an activist sense, in the, going to the streets and producing this uh, graphic material that is ob obviously very important, but we should think about the stories that we're creating, the visual stories, the narratives that we're creating. So, for instance. Uh, I think that we have some initiatives here in Brazil that are very beautiful that are creating stock, like a um, stock image of black people, of queer people, of trans people, uh, just to so that all designers and illustrators and people in media can start to work with the material that is more diverse in its uh, core. Yeah, no, and what, what would you consider after the, this representation, which you already nuance as a, as a multiple representation, or in the, I would say empowerment through the image, what what would you consider would be the next steps we need to make? Like in design? That's the question. My last question yeah. would be like, <laughs> yeah. what, what can't design do? But we'll keep that one for the last few minutes. But what would you see after the visualization would we be the next steps? I think... I always think of, I don't know if next step, but a step that we should be thinking about and, and, and taking now is uh, organization. Because basically I see that especially social media has had this effect of fragmentation lately where you feel like everything is um, falling upon the individual so that you have to post something or say something for yourself and then you feel like you've designed and you've created and you've altered the project and then there is no need for articulation and collaboration and organization for, as a, a, a much uh, bigger action to take. So I think no matter what we are try trying to do with design, we should be discussing it and we should be together and should be close and seeing ourselves as more powerful when we get organized. But especially in Brazil now, we have a very hard time with that. But 
because with the social isolation and numbers in COVID growing. Yeah, you're, activity, you're still in the, uh, yeah. It's kind of the challenge now, but yeah. I see that organization is a very powerful tactic that we should be thinking of right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Camina, also for you, this question of what could be the next, what, what is the next phase? Is it uh, rooted in education or, I mean, we're talking also about uh, notions of systemic bias and um, how social justice, in fact, could be um, could be moving uh, the whole envelope of uh, gender equality further. Yes. W so what would you consider I, key? Yes, I agree with Larissa. I think it's like education, dissemination, organization, and actually like educating the like the next generation of designers, students, communication, like people that dedicate their lives to the visuals and communication is like how to deconstruct this, this colonialism, like this colonialism in the way you think about race and gender and who, who should do like the terms in which we relate to each other. Yeah. So that would be, I mean, that, that is really powerful, I think. Um, yeah. I was also thinking while preparing for this conversation that um, I'm sure that there's a lot of men out there who in fact absolutely don't identify with, uh, let's say the patriar patriarchal model that they themselves exact exactly need to live up to for lack of a better word. Right. Um, given the time, uh, we are already sort of at the end of our conversation. So I want to just, maybe you could point out where you see which is not the role of design in this. Well, policy making, I mean, like, really, there has to be more people in policy making, like making like uh, paving the road. So people can jump in like designers, architects, jump in and help, but we can't, we can push policy by protesting and speaking up. But we can't actually make the policy like people in power have to like really uh, open up. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point on the horizon. Um, mm -hmm. Larissa, for you, the point on the horizon or what design can't do? Yeah, I think... Um... Yes, Sorry, I can. I yes, I had, you came a little had, late, I had, but I can hear you. I, I had some connection issues. Uh, I think that we must uh, be aware that we cannot be closed in a design designer's world, you know. I think that design obviously has its limitations, but we should be um, speaking to people in social movements. We should be reading what's being re what's being written in literature today. We should be very um, aware of the situation so that we cannot be stopped by these limitations that design obviously has, but think about it as an interdisciplinary um, matter, you know? So we can, like, I'm a designer, but I'm also studying anthropology or literature or looking at, like, outside the doors of my studio to see, to connect with the needs of society, and not only, like, be drawing a poster with a Swiss typography that has nothing to do with my culture here in Brazil, you know? So also that questioning why European design is so hegemonic and why do we value so much like uh, this uh, typographic standards, image standards that come from the United States and Europe. So um, I think that we should be thinking critically at this time and wondering why the standards that we use here are valid or not yeah so one of one of my yeah. one of my no, students not, keeps on pointing out actually that it's the, that it's still somehow the european gaze that is dominating the, the the discourse in your culture which seems something that we really all need to work on to create and break um those old rigid uh, uh systems yes. um and it, it has is, also sorry it has so much to do with the way design is taught here in Brazil, because we just we have like this design history or architecture history, looking at what the great Europeans did and maybe not valuing what we have here. But I think that's changing too. I couldn't agree more. At least I am I'm helping that change. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it was way too short to talk about all the complexities dealing uh, with creating for gender equality and 
uh, intersectionality and the solidarity that this demands um, on, on, uh, on, on race, on class, on education. Thank you for shedding some light on, uh, into your, uh, on your political reality and uh, your cultural uh, life and uh, the difference you make uh, for us. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm just going to um, say also on behalf of Design uh, Centro di Futuras and of course on behalf of the whole team of What Design Can Do. Uh, for those of you out there who would want to revisit the conversation, I checked twice, uh, no actually three times and there were no questions. So either it was all crystal clear or the question <laughs> will come later. I'm sure you can be reached for those. For those of you, as mentioned, who want to revisit either the conversation on media and design, on decolonizing design itself, and our conversation on, um, on gender issues and design, you can visit the websites of Design or What Design Can Do, the channels of YouTube or on Facebook. Thank you very much for joining me and us. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Kemina. My name Thank is Saskia you. Stein for What Design Can Do and greeting you from Rotterdam. Have a Thank nice you. evening. Thank Bye. You. Ciao. Bye, Hola. Ciao.